video we look at a class 2 composite mandibular molar restoration on tooth number 19 so the first thing you need to do is to isolate the tooth replace the missing wall with your matrix band so that you can use with a tofomine retainer or you can use a segmented matrix whatever system you're comfortable with and then use a wedge right at the cervical area so that there is no overhang and once you're done with that make sure you burnish your matrix band to the opposing tooth to the adjacent tooth to ensure that whatever restorative material you place inside ends up with a good contact and you'll see that we also used bonding agent even though it's a plastic tooth this is because the bonding agent helps to close the voids that sometimes your restorative material may not reach and it also gives you a little bit of addition. You don't want your restorative material to come out when the examiner is trying to evaluate your restoration. So now that you've placed some bonding agent, make sure you blow some air on it and then cure it. We're ready to restore this tooth. In exams, it really does not matter what shade of composite you use. What matters is that you're fully condensed the restorative material and there are no gaps or voids. With a class 2, the best technique is to start condensing the material, as you can see, on the occlusal side of it. In another video of ours, we'll show you a different technique where we'll be condensing composite on the proximal box area first, basically making this class 2 cavity into a class 1 cavity and then treating it like a class 1 cavity after removing our top of my band. That's a different video altogether where we restore it on a premolar. In this video, we'll be restoring the occlusal part of the cavity first. So now we're using a cleoid discoid carver to create some sort of an anatomy while you're condensing your first layer of composite. Composite cures in layers, so don't try to be hasty and don't try to fill it all at once and cure it at once. Instead, cure it in layers. Another technique that you can use, which we see over here, is apply some bonding agent on top of the composite that you just condensed. What the bonding agent does is it helps to improve the plasticity of the material so that it becomes more workable and you're able to create any sort of carving or it gives a smooth finish at the end. However, when you're done with your restoration, do not put bonding agent on top of the finished restoration because it does two things one is the examiner might think that you're trying to fool the examiner by closing the voids using bonding agent you don't want to do that and two when you cure it at that moment it'll look all right but after a bit, after a bit when the examiner is trying to evaluate it it sometimes becomes sticky and that's not something that the examiners usually like so once you're done with the restoration, stay away from using bonding agent. So now that we're done with our first layer of composite, we can go ahead and start adding our second layer. And this time we're going to be adding it into the proximal box. When you're condensing composite or amalgam into the proximal box, make sure that you're condensing it all the way so that the material goes up to the cervical area, covering the gingival floor and you don't have any voids you're left with. Leaving a void in a restoration is a critical failure. And the time that it takes to correct a void is much greater than filling this restoration itself. So spend some additional time to ensure that your material has completely condensed all the way to the cervical area by placing apical pressure using a condensing instrument or a plastic instrument. And then you can use a sharp tip of an explorer to remove any excess composite that's flowed over between the matrix band and the buckle of the proximal walls, which would be difficult to remove if you've already cured the material. Once you're done with that, go ahead and cure the material.
Once you're happy with how much material you've condensed in the proximal box area and you've created a wall, you can now go ahead and remove your wedge and your matrix pad. Because right now, you only need to add material on the occlusal aspect of the cavity, which can be easily done since you've already completed the box area. When condensing additional composite onto the occlusal aspect of the cavity, you'll notice how we condense it by placing the plastic instrument flat against the cusps and the grooves. This helps you create that initial anatomy that we're looking for instead of just adding material flat onto the occlusal surface. If you use this technique where you take some composite material and then you condense it by placing your plastic instrument flat on top of the occlusal on top of the cusps or the grooves that helps you create that initial anatomy and that can guide you to finish the restoration when you're using your burrs and your hand instruments at the end.
Once you're done curing the restorative material, use the tip of an explorer, run it across the restoration, run it from the tooth to the restoration and restoration to the tooth to ensure that it's completely hard and cured and that there are no voids that you may need to fill at this point. And when you're happy with it, go ahead and do a final cure which will help to just wrap things up before you use a burr or something that's more aggressive on this restoration. At this point, we are ready to finish this restoration. So you can start off by gross reduction of excess material that may have flown over to your tooth structure using a slow speed burr and a diamond um, or a carbide. A diamond usually works out well for gross reduction. In this case, we are still following the anatomy of the occlusal surface with the rise and fall of the cusps and just going around, smoothing out the surface, removing any excess that may have flown around. All the time being careful that you're not removing any additional material, don't try to create any ditch, and try not to place your diamond on the tooth structure because that would create some scratches that you don't want to have. Once you're done with your gross reduction, you can start using a white stone or any other stone like a green stone to, use the to do the final finishing of your composite restoration. At this point, you're only doing those fine touches where you're refining your triangular fossa, your grooves, and your central groove, and making sure 
that the, in the proximal box area, your marginal ridge is at the same height as the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth, making sure that there is no excess material that is still left over, uh, no flash that can be detected with the, with the explorer. And then we can use our favorite instrument, which is the white stone. Start using your white stone to remove any fine scratches that you would have left behind with your finishing diamonds. And use this to further smoothen your, to further smoothen your restoration, having it flow with the natural occlusal anatomy, and making sure that your marginal ridge is not sharp, it's smooth and rounded and at the same height as the adjacent tooth. At this point, we're almost done finishing our restoration. And you can take a look around your restoration to make sure that there's nothing sharp. At this point, we can see that the marginal ridge area is a little sharp and it might be even a tad bit higher than the adjacent tooth. So at this point, you can see, use something like IPC, the interproximal carver, which is really smooth and sharp, or the tip of the explorer. A better instrument to use would be the IPC, um, and just use that in that area to remove the sharpness. Using a burr would be a little bit risky because you might damage the adjacent tooth. But you can see that even the tip of an explorer did a good job at removing that sharp sledge of composite material and once you're done with that use a floss to make sure that you have established contact and then your respiration is good to go